Assalamu alaikum. So I'm live streaming right now to Facebook. Apparently, uh, according to YouTube, you have to have at least uh, 1,000 subscribers before I can just live stream from my mobile phone. Um, so here I am on Facebook, and I'm going to re upload this, of course, to YouTube. Today, I want to continue my series on the history of the Hanafi Madhab, and I want to talk about. Um, of the early period and what are the hallmarks of Hanafi epistemology and I'm going to talk about you know what orientalists uh, say about this as well as what uh, you know Muslim historians have to say about it um, from the East uh, Arab countries and whatnot and so basically uh, to start out uh, Abu Hanifa himself as we know, he left us no uh, type of legal primer, no muhtasr, no, and of course, Abu Hanif is the founder of the Hanafi school of Islamic jurisprudence. Um, he left us no type of legal text, really. But there are scant uh, theological writings and hadith uh, transmissions, you know, from him. You have like Musnad Abu Hanifa. You know, you have al wasiya you have uh, a book, you know, Fiqh al-Akbar, and these types of things, Risala, that he has to the uh, Uthman al-Batti, and, and these types of things um, that I've uh, mentioned before. Um, so it was more his students, especially Abu Yusuf and Muhammad Shaybani, who really conveyed his legal opinions, and their, some of their texts have reached us today, not all of them. Um, if you look at the Fihrist of Ibn Nadim, and that's basically like a pre-modern bibliography, very extensive bibliography, he, he tried to gather in writing a list of every single book that he ever seen. And so there's books from uh, Muhammad Shaybani and Abu Yusuf that are listed that no longer are extant. We, we don't have them anymore. They don't exist today. They're lost to history. Perhaps they're sitting in a manuscript collection somewhere and hasn't been sorted through because there's just not enough people with training to deal with Islamic manuscripts to sift through all the hundreds of thousands of manuscripts out there sitting in uh, museums under preservation. And, you know, Abu Yusuf and Muhammad Shaybani, they're also the greatest historical witnesses to Abu Hanifa. They disagreed with their own teacher and recorded, you know, his opinion, his disagreement with them. Um, so that's a really important uh, concept, too, is when they disagreed, they preser preserved Abu Hanifa's opinion. So to the historian, uh, you know, we can have a bit more certainty maybe as to what Abu Hanifa's opinions were. Um, previous scholarship focused primarily on like the small secondary works uh, of Abu Yusuf and Muhammad Shaybani, you know, like Rad ala Siyar al Awza'i, Hujja ala Ahl al Medina, or Kitab al Kharaj, or these different books that are kind of smaller and more uh, tertiary, if, if you will. Um, and they completely ignored uh, Muhammad Shaybani's magnum opus, Kitab al Asl, which I've mentioned before in uh, this series. So, uh, Bedr. Bergstreise, Patricia Crone, Goldseer, Wal Halak, Khazna, Melchert, Sadiqi, Shacht, Vikur, Vishnaf, and many others, uh, they don't consult Shaybani's multi volume Kitab al Asl, which is strange. If you're writing about the early period and you're writing about other works, you know, that the that uh, Abu Yusuf and Muhammad Shaybani have. Uh, you know, on their works that what they've written on, you know, Kitab al-Asl, you'd think would be a natural place to go. Uh, Joseph Lowry, he cites it every now and then, um, but he doesn't seem to work, work with it too extensively. Um, and, and it's strange because this is probably the oldest extant legal text on top of everything else. Um, maybe uh, the works of Al-Fazari, who was a student of Awza'i and Sufyan al-Thawri, might be older it's a it's contemporaneous you might say i'm not sure exactly which could be dated earlier but those are like the oldest legal texts out there and so it's kind of strange that they're not really uh you know dealing with kitab al-usl 
and Bieg Streza himself, you know, he, he admitted that other these small tertiary texts like from Abu Yusuf, and that's Gotthelf Bieg Streza, the, the doctoral supervisor for uh, Schacht, um, you know, German scholar, uh, he, he admits that these other tertiary texts from Abu Yusuf and Shebani are kind of a little help to get at legal theory or usul fiqh. And it's, it's kind of because there's usul in it, okay? There's uh, fundaments or uh, theorems or however you want to translate that. Um, and throughout the book, he's constantly saying, well, uslu dhalik, you know, X, Y, Z. The theory behind that is such and such, you know, explicate it. And there's an epistemic series. There's a, you know, a shift away um, from what you may call local Kufan practice, although that could be debated too because, uh, you know, Ibn Abi Layla was also a Kufan jurist who disagreed. Uh, Sufyan al-Thawri was also a Kufan jurist who disagreed with Abu Hanifa. So, I mean, what really is Kufan practice? Can we define it? I, I'm not so sure. But I feel like Abu Hanifa tried to portray himself as an inheritor of the Tabi'een and Sahaba in, in those terms. So in that sense, you might, I can see why someone might try to frame it as local practice like Shah did. Um, but uh, it seems more like Shaybani is trying to move away from that. That's not, and during his time, the, uh, I guess you might say epistemology shifted and people were not so concerned anymore with local practice and where the real kind of, uh, you might say, evidence or uh, epistemic value, like what people really thought was convincing was that you had narrations you know, going back to the Prophet Muhammad Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam himself or to uh, Sahaba, you know, these different reports, the hadith and trying to emphasize this is the sunnah became uh, much more emphasized than before. Before it was still important. You can see that Awza'i himself still cared about these things, but it became more emphasized during the time of Muhammad Shibani. And so there is a distinct shift that way. And another thing that's really important about Kitab al-Asl is that you have uh, explicit uh, mentions of Qiyas and Istihsan. So uh, not only you have a shift a little bit away from Abu Hanifa in some regards, but uh, and this, this goes against like Vikor, who thought that there was little uh, you know, differences between uh, Abu Hanifa, Muhammad Shabani, and Abu Yusuf. I mean, if you read the source text, they're disagreeing with each other all the time. So I don't know what he's sp supposed to mean by that. But there's a lot of places in Kitab al-Asl where it, it mentions istihsan and qiyas. And, it, you know, some of these old Orientalists, uh, there's one, I think his name is pronounced Yaakov Miron. He said uh, Kitab al-Asl is, lit, and I quote here, is little more than an algum, al, algl, agglomeration of legal propositions without explanation arranged in an arbitrary fashion, unquote. Um, which to me just seems academically dishonest. I mean, it makes you wonder if he even read the text at all. And this is a text that's been available in manuscript form for quite a long time. It was published even, uh, you know, in the 80s and, and print form. So I'm not sure what he's talking about there. Even uh, Joseph Schacht, he had a copy of it, you know, in his Cairo apartment uh, in the 40s. So I'm kind of confused where this guy, uh, Meron, is coming from. Because um, a basic skim of the text reveals that there are explicit notions um, of Qiyas and Istihsan, that is analogical legal reasoning, and you might call it juristic preference, okay? And so uh, I have a forthcoming uh, academic article, uh, the history of the Hanafi Madhab, that's going to be coming out in Rutledge's uh, Handbook to Islamic Ritual and Practice, which is maybe come out at the end of 2021, or it'll come out 2022, something like that. So if you want to get all the 
sources for all this, the bibliography and whatnot. Uh, you'll be able to find it there later. But basically, uh, Kitab al-Usl in modern print right now is about 12 volumes. And multiple, multiple times in each volume, you will find explicit mentions of Qiyas and Istihsan. And there is some explanation given behind the legal reasoning behind many different uh, rulings. And he'll even, uh, Muhammad Shaybani will talk about where he disagrees on certain topics with other Hanafis, people who are also students of Abu Hanifa in the same circle. So there, there is uh, sometimes explicit uh, legal uh, epistemology that's being explained by Muhammad Shaybani himself. Uh, and Kitab Hujja uh, ala Ahl al Medina also goes into that a bit. In fact, Abu Yusuf himself, he uses the word usul fiqh in his uh, refutation of Imam Awza'i, Rad ala Siyar al Awza'i. So there, there is explicit, explicit types of uh, usul fiqh, if you will, or legal epistemology before Imam Shafi'i's Risala, although it's not in the same format as Imam Shafi'i's Risala, it still is a type of legal epistemology. And Imam Shafi'i, he wasn't the first to talk about khas and am and these types of linguistic hermeneutics either. That was something that started with the Mu'tazila, who most, most of which were Hanafis. Uh, most of the Hanafis were Mu'tazila. This is a historical reality some people are not so comfortable always uh, talking about. But these discussions were going on before Shafi'i and one might say that Shafi'i's Risala is a response or maybe even a refutation of the Hanafis and the Mu'tazila who really were one group at that time but people nowadays they don't like to categorize it that way and so I mean Kitab al-Asl also has many ahadith in it um, that are cited uh, that are found in later canonical hadith collections. Uh, they're found in like uh, Musannaf uh, Abdul Razak al Sanani or uh, Ibn Abi Shayba and, and these types of things. So we know that, you know, the Hanafis were using hadith, that whole idea that they're just because they're labeled as Ahl al Ra'i, they're not using hadith or they're using different hadith than the, the Ahl al Hadith that's just uh, false. And that's been more or less, uh, I would say, proven or strongly argued by Scott Lucas's articles. Uh, Scott Lucas, who's now, I believe, at the University of Arizona in Tucson. And so, I mean, when we try to look at what is early uh, Hanafi legal epistemology, uh, one of the big kind of hallmarks that they had was emphasizing the Hadith Mashur. That is, uh, Hadith, in order to be used for Islamic jurisprudence, it had to have at least three chains of narration uh, during the time of the Salaf. That's what's called a uh, Hadith Mashhur. And uh, it literally kind of means like a famous Hadith or widespread Hadith. And they also, you know, of course, used what's called Hadith Mutawatir or mass transmitted Hadith that had uh, lots and lots of chains of uh, narration. Some ulama, they say, you know, Mutawatir hadith has 10 chains or more. Um, but there is disagreement as to what exactly constitutes Mutawatir. But, of course, it's more than three chains. Um, and this uh, coincides with the Mu'tazila. Most of the Mu'tazila, when it came to things that were even uh, non-fiqh issues, they emphasized the hadith mashhur as well. So this is definitely a connection between the Mu'tazila and the Hanafis. Like I said, they, they could have been characterized as maybe one group back then, but because of the Mihna, there was a division, there was a shift, there were, you know, the, the Mu'tazila lost prestige over time, although they were active until uh, the 1500s with a constant uh, chain of transmission. Um, and you can, you know, read Tabaqat and Mu'tazila, I can show you that book uh, later. Um, but yeah, there's a lot of similarities in epistemology between the Mu'tazila and the Hanafis. Um, and so the Hadith Wahid or Hadith Ahad um, was, uh, you might call it a solitary narration 
that was something that typically the Hanafis would not use for jurisprudence back then. Um, uh, there was a distinction uh, made by Isa Aban between um, what you would call the Hadith Wahid or and or Khabr Wahid and Khabr Jama'a or the uh, Hadith Hadith Al Jama'a, which basically Mashhur. So that was kind of the terminology that he used uh, during that time. Uh, of course, it took a little while for everything to kind of become more codified with specialized. Uh, terminology where everybody's using the term hadith mashhur but the idea the concept was still relatively the same um, and you know uh, there were a lot of mu'tazila also who denied all hadith except the mutawatir hadith so in one sense the the hanafis may have played an intermediary role between those mu'tazila who denied all hadith except mutawatir and the you know ahl al-hadith who accepted the hadith wahid or a hadith al-ahad with a lot of epistemological authority but basically in, in summation obviously the quran the kalam allah is the number one ranking in their epistemology then after that you have the hadith or the sunnah the mutawatir uh, ranks first then you have the mashhur hadith ranks second and then third is the wahid hadith or hadith al-ahad. After that, you had consensus, ijma'. You had an analogy, qiyas, sometimes could supersede consensus in certain circumstances. And then you had istihsan, which could su supersede those in, in some certain circumstances too. But it was, you know, lower on the totem pole. And then at the bottom, you would have uh, culture and custom or urf and ada. And, you know, some might say that this is subsumed as part of istihsan. And, uh, you know, the Hanafis were, when it comes to linguistic hermeneutics, they were known to prefer, to prefer the am or the general statements, just like the Mu'tazila, over the, the khas, the kind of more particularization. Um, in, in Vishnaf, he did a lot of work on uh, linguistic hermeneutics um, so I would recommend uh, looking at his uh, book, which is uh, quite excellent. And all of these uh, authors and books that I'm referencing, I'll try to put them below in the description when I re-upload this to YouTube. So you, you can find those uh, below in the description. Um, if there is, you know, a link to like Amazon or, or something like that, I'll put that down there as well. So you can go and kind of look at it further. Um, let's see here. And that based on something higher on the totem pole, the epistemological totem pole, if, if you will. Um, so like, for instance, uh, Hadith Wahid just has a single chain of narration would be interpreted in light of the Hadith Mashur. If it contradicted the Hadith Mashur, it might be thrown out. Um, you know, the Hadith Mashur would clarify what the hadith wahid is meaning so uh, that's an important uh, uh, epistemological tool where with uh, Imam Shafi'i it might have been the other way around um, and then if something's ambiguous um, then the hadith mashhur would clarify the ambiguous hadith wahid if that makes sense and so, if there was no ambiguity or contradiction, then there was no need to consult really a lower level of the epistemology as well. So, sometimes you might have a hadith mashhur where it's a little ambiguous, you're not quite so sure what it means or contradicts another hadith mashhur. You might bring in a hadith wahid to kind of explain that or elucidate that or clarify that, okay? And so this was kind of a unique characteristic to Hanafi textual criticism or Hanafi legal epistemology that you don't really see with the other um, madhahib, other schools of Islamic jurisprudence. And they had a heavier focus on the metan, the content of the hadith, rather than just the chain of narration, the isnad. So they, of course, they would look at the isnad but they would uh, more scrutinize the, the metan much more than like the Ahl al-Hadith would. 
And even when it came to the Isnad, they were much more, you might say, uh, apt to accept hadith that might have a cut or that might be mursal. Okay. Uh, mursal meaning that uh, a tabi'i said that the Prophet said without there being a companion in between them, a uh, sahabi in between them. Because if that tabi'i was well known uh, to be just and to be moral and upright and, you know, have uh, accuracy and transmission and all these types of things, um, then, you know, it wasn't expected that, that he would lie. It's just assumed that, of course, he studied under a companion. And so uh, Hanafis were much more apt to accept those types of hadiths where Ahl al-Hadith were not. And similar to Malikis, you know, nascent Hanafis considered the practice of the Salaf to be representative of prophetic sunnah. So if everybody in Kufa is doing a certain thing, um, then most likely it, it came from the Sahaba and came from the Prophet. And so it's kind of like Amul Ahl al Medina. The, you know, the Hanafis would give weight to that, especially if there was like a hadith mashur to back it up. Um, and, you know, if there was a hadith wahid, hadith wahid that contradicted the normative practice in Kufa, they might uh, look at that with some suspicion. And, you know, also in like another important point in uh, Hanafi uh, linguistic hermeneutics is that uh, the particle wow, which means and in Arabic, did not uh, imply a se sequential order for Hanafis. It didn't imply tartib. So you'd say, and this, and this, and this. You could do that in any order, those four things. For Shafi'is, you have to follow that order. Wow implies tartib for Shafi'is. And so that's an important distinction between the Hanafis and the Shafi'is when it comes to linguistic hermeneutics. Is the wow, does it imply tartib? or not, sequential order or not. So where this comes into play is with wudu. When you're making wudu, do you have to follow the order that's mentioned in Qur'an, even though it's just a wow in between each item, you know, uh, or not? And so we can get to that here. Let me get to where I have that. Um, so the, the verse in translation goes, O you who have believed, when you stand up to perform prayer, salah, wash your faces and, wow, your hands to the elbows and wipe your heads and f your feet to the ankles, okay? So does that wow imply a sequence? Do you have to, do you have to wash your faces first, then your hands to the elbows or your arms, then your head and and then your feet, the Hanafis would say no. You can do it in any order, that's fine. It's better to follow the order, but it's not necessary to follow the order. Where the Shafi'is would say it's necessary to follow that order, that sequence. All right, so that's an important a distinction and it's a hallmark of the Hanafis. And it's something that if you were out in the public and you'd seen someone making wudu starting with their feet, you would know they're Hanafi, all right? And so that's kind of like uh, how this epistemology gets put into practice. And, and this is, you know, uh, reported in like uh, uh, by Al Kasani, Al uh, Bada'i, Al Sana'i, and Nasafi, uh, Quduri, um, so like Mukhtasar uh, Quduri, Kanza Daqa'iq. It's mentioned in uh, uh, Al Hidayah from Al Marghinani and, and so on. So, this is something that's like kind of widely uh, explicated in the Hanafi Madhab, very uh, widely known. And um, so, uh, the Hanafi Madhab is kind of unique in the way that it deals with hadith, as we've seen epistemologically. But also, uh, many of the hadith that the Hanafis use as evidence, especially in the more early period, before the Mamluk period, 
they were using hadith that were transmitted through their own chains of transmission that are not really found in today what are the six canonical hadith collections. So you'd find a lot of the hadiths or versions of them in like the Musannif of uh, Abd Razak al-San'ani or Ibn Abi Shayba, like I mentioned just a moment ago. Um, but really they're just found in the Hanafi texts, the shuruh, the commentary texts, um, where these hadiths are mentioned and, and transmitted there. And they're repeated in you know later commentaries and things like that. It's not really until the Mamluk period where you have Kamal din Ibn al-Humam, who he write, writes this uh, usul al-fiqh book called At-Tahrir, where he compares uh, Shafi'i usul al-fiqh with Hanafi usul al-fiqh and kind of makes the argument that there are some things from Shafi'i usul al-fiqh maybe that we should adopt and maybe that uh, we should put more emphasis on using hadith from the six canonical collections in order to kind of uh, refute... Uh, the polemics from uh, Shafi'is and Hanbalis and you know people of other madhabs, people who try to always say, oh, Hanafis aren't using the Hadith. We know that Hanafis have always been using Hadith, but they've had their own chains of transmissions and their own books for these Hadith. Okay, but because the status of uh, Sitta as sahiha these six canonical collections, Bukhari, Muslim, you know, Ibn Majah, and Nasa'i, Tirmidhi, and, and so forth, so on and so forth, and some of the smaller ones, you know, Mustadrak and you know, Bayhaqi, and all, all these, you know, different things out there, Ibn Hiban, and, and so on, um, that, you know, Ibn al Humam was arguing, arguing that we should use these hadiths more in our. Um, Hanafi commentaries to convince people from other madhabs. But before that, uh, the Hanafis were just using hadith kind of that they transmitted within their own circles. And so that's kind of a very characteristic of how the Hanafis used uh, evidence and how they dealt with uh, hadith in an applied fashion. You know, so they have this different unique uh, legal epistemology. And then they also have their own unique uh, evidence, if, if you will. They're transmitting different hadiths, uh, basically. And so uh, I think that I would encourage a lot of the muhaddithin, contemporary muhaddithin, to look at these Hanafi, Hanafi commentaries and match up those hadith with hadith found in the Sitta Sahiha, and they should go through and look at the Isnad and all those things and kind of write a commentary just on those hadiths. Like if you go to Nasbur Raya, which is a commentary for Al Hidayah on just uh, the hadith proofs. Uh, but even if you go to much bigger books like that from uh, Ibn Ujaym and the likes, I think you will, uh, I think that would be a great endeavor. And if somebody's already done it, I'm just unaware. Um, so that's a, a big kind of. Uh, a characteristic of the Hanafi method. One of the big reasons that they didn't uh, use like Al-Bukhari, for instance, a lot is because Al-Bukhari was a known bigot. Um, he was muta'asab. He was very anti-Hanafi for like uh, just his own kind of uh, hizbi, uh you know, clicky uh, uh, way. Um, he was just kind of very disparaging to Hanafis uh, without really making arguments against them, if, if that makes sense, without engaging with their texts or engaging uh, with them in any meaningful way. He was just kind of very, uh, had this group mentality allied to the Ahl al-Hadith. Um, so if someone ha had, uh, what's the best word for ta'asub, if someone had just kind of this group mentality where they weren't even willing to engage with you on an equal level, um, the Hanafis would not take their Hadith transmissions if they were just bigoted against Hanafis, basically. And so that's one of the reasons they don't use Bukhari. And one of the kind of hallmarks, maybe, of, of Hanafi uh, practice is that um, they put the hands below the navel in ritual prayer, tahta surah. Um, so they, they have the hands uh, below the belly button. And that's... Uh, they do that because there's many hadiths um, you find in uh, Abd Razak al-Sana'ani's Musannif and the Musannif of Ibn Abi Shayba and within the Hanafi texts that uh, narrate, uh, you know, 
having the hands below the navel. It was the practice of Ibn Mas'ud. It was the practice of Ali ibn Abi Talib, radiallahu anhumah. And so they, they uh, go with those hadith because they're mashhur. And you might say they're hasan or sahih laghayri. There's such a, a big transmission of them, even though they might, some of them, a lot of them may be classified as da'if. Even uh, Ahmed uh, bin al-Hanbal said that. And Ahmed ibn Hanbal's opinion was also to have the hands below the navel. Um, and the Hanafis uh, of Hanifa also said to have the hand below the navel. Um, and nowadays that is still maintained where most of the Hanbalis do not do that. Um, and so in kind of in summation, that's kind of why Hanafis pray with the hands below the navel. Um, another is Raf al Yadain, or raising the hands. And this is after the, uh, you know, the opening of the prayer. Um, you know, so Awza'i and the Ahl al-Hadith were known to raise their hands after the opening of the prayer. However, the Ibn Mas'ud and Ali, who both lived in Kufa, did not raise their hands after the takbir, the opening of the prayer. Uh, iftitah al-Tahrim, or takbir al-Tahrim, or whatever you uh, want to call it. Um, Sufyan al-Thawri also didn't do that. Um, so, you know, the Hanafis go with that opinion, basically. Um, there's more hadiths, um, more uh, chains of narration, rather. Um, that uh, go with that practice and that was the communal practice of Kufa for the most part. So that's uh, basically what they followed and they have their own hadith that they mentioned you know in Hanafi uh, hadith collections like the you know Somali Hanafi scholar Jamal al-Din al in his book Nasb al-Raya li ahadith al-Hidayah he brings lots of hadith you know evincing the Hanafi position of not raising the hands. So these were hadiths transmitted by Hanafi scholars that you don't really find in the canonical six collections. And another peculiarity of the Hanafi madhab is that it's haram or forbidden to recite behind the imam. And this goes back to their uh, linguistic hermeneutics and how they uh, would interpret something as being general, am. So you have a verse in the Qur'an, and remember the Qur'an takes the most superior epistemic level. There's a verse in the Qur'an, you know, that basically says, do not recite behind the Imam. And then they also transmit hadiths where the Prophet is saying, this is found in the Musannaf of uh, Abdul Razak al-Sana'ani, are you reciting behind me, and this is Prophet saying this, are you reciting behind me while I am reciting? Do not do that. Rather, one should recite Al-Fatiha internally, silently. So, fi nafsihi sirran. And the Quranic verse goes, So when the Quran is recited, listen to it and remain silent, that you may receive mercy. So those are the, the big evidences there that the Hanafis will use um, in regards to this. And so that hadith goes along with the Quranic verse, so they bring it as a proof. And there's no hadith wahid or hadith ahad that if it contradicts this, this Quranic verse, they'll just simply throw it out because the Quran is a supreme epistemic authority. No khas uh, statement is going to override an am statement, a general statement like this, this Quranic verse here. And so in a nutshell, that is uh, the the proof for why Hanafis do not, uh, you know, uh, kind of recite behind the Imam, uh, where if you go to like a Shafi'i Masjid, Masjid or Hanbali Masjid, you hear them kind of doing their own silent kind of type of recitation uh, like that behind the Imam. And Hanafis don't audibly recite Amin after the Imam finishes reciting the Fatiha. Um, Whereas the other madhabs, uh, Shafi'i and Hanbali madhab, they will, you know, recite Amin out loud. And it says here, Sufyan al-Thawri also reported that Ibrahim al nakhai did not audibly recite Amin. And that's also found in uh, Abdul Razak al-Sana'ani's Musannif. And so again, like raising the hands in prayer, the Hanafis 
they they admit that the prophet may have done this, you know, on some occasions, said Amin out loud. Um, but that was not the, f the final thing he did. That was not his final ruling. Um, moreover, there's a lot of hadiths that report that the Amin was said silently and Hanafis opt for those reports um, because they had more chains of narration. They were mashur uh, during the time of the Salaf. And it's also commonly known that, you know, Muslims pray five times a day. But with Hanafis, it's actually six. There is a mandatory wajib, sixth prayer, called witr, which is perform performed at night as the, like the last prayer. Even after voluntary night prayers like tahajjud or qiyam, these types of things. Um, and it, it also differs in its gesticulations, like its, its movements, um, by adding uh, the qunut, uh, which is kind of like a dua, a supplication that's uh, during the prayer. And um, other schools, uh, they acknowledge witr, but they don't categorize it as mandatory, and they, of course, perform it differently. So Hanafis perform witr as three continuous units, you know, raka'ats, of prayer, um, whereas like Shafi'is will they will split them up. Hanbalis will split them up. Okay, they'll they'll give you know the salams each way and and split it up. Okay, and you know uh, not surprising, uh, the Hanafis follow the opinion of Ibrahim al Nakhai, who was the teacher of the teacher of Abu Hanifa, in this regard. As you know, Sufyan al-Thawri is kind of the main historical witness, besides you know the Hanafis, on Ibrahim and Nakhari's opinions, because Sufyan al-Thawri reports from him so much in the Musannaf of uh, Abd Razak al-Sanani. So, in a nutshell, that's kind of early Hanafi uh, epistemology. I know I've talked on some of this before, but I just wanted to kind of bring some more uh, information on it. And also bring you um, just kind of uh, how it's put into practice in the Hanafi Medheb a little bit. Um, and I know it's kind of, I'm just trying to give a brief summary. I'm not trying to go quite too much into detail with all of it. Um, and then maybe we could talk later about the next phase of the Hanafi Medheb where it starts to transition from being in the central... Uh, I guess you might say Islamic civilization heartlands like Iraq and uh, those kind of the, the Middle East there and starts moving over um, to Central Asia and Central Asia becoming the main hub of Hanafi thought. Central Asia, Transoxania, you know, Balkh and uh, Termid and Bukhara and, and these types of places. Um, and, you know, we can get to talking about you know, Hanafism in the Ottoman Empire, Hanafism in China, Hanafism, you know, in contemporary times in, in the Indian Asian subcontinent, uh, and, um, you know, so on and so forth. Um, uh, and if you guys are interested too, I also started myself a class on the history of the Hanafi Medheb, um, which is taught by Salman Yunus who uh, got his doctorate, I believe it is from Oxford University. Um, so I can put a, a link to that below. I'm not sure if they're accepting new students or not, but I just want to make you guys aware of that. Um, and he, he goes into way more detail in this class on uh, very uh, you know specialized things when it comes to the history of the Hanafi Medheb. So if you know Arabic and you want to get much more specialized than the stuff I'm giving here, I highly recommend uh, that class. And yeah, I guess that's pretty much it for this video. Salam alaikum. Peace out. Thanks again for watching my YouTube channel. I want to ask you to, you know, donate to my Patreon if you can, if you're able to, so that I can keep making these videos and be able to make them much more sophisticated for you and dedicate more time to them. Please also check out my Facebook page, Hamza the Historian. You can also find me on Twitter. Um, please check out my other video series. I just did a video series on the history of the Mu'atabirun movement, which might be called a Sufi movement or mystical movement in Islamic Spain. And please support me in more videos to come. I want to hear what you guys are interested in. 
I want to know what future videos you guys want to see, so please, please put comments down below and let me know what it is that you want to see from my channel and I can, you know, make note of that and try to come out with some videos on those topics. Thank you very much for watching and please subscribe for more videos and give my video a like.